Hi guys, Dennis here. In this video, I'm going to discuss with you GCE O Level Physics October November 2023 Paper 2. Subject code is 6091. This video is brought to you by A Swift Dennis. Now, learning can be smart, not hard. Also, don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification button to stop missing out free lessons from me all right let's start to discuss the paper question one figure 1.1 shows the displacement time graph for a man traveling from point a along a straight horizontal road the man starts at time t equal to zero and initially moves in the direction due north a state the position of the man relative to point A at time equals 500 seconds, 2 marks. So from the distance time graph, we look at the time at 500 seconds and it gives us negative 200 meters. So at first it is in the direction of due north and when the displacement is a negative value, it means it is in the opposite direction. Hence, the answer for this question is 200 meters due south. B. Determine the total distance the man travels in 500 seconds. One mark. So, to calculate the total distance, for this case, it will be 240 meters plus 240 meters plus 200 meters. Okay, the reason is because for the first 200 meters, we start from 0 to this position, 150 seconds. So the distance here is 240 meters. Then he take a rest for about 50 seconds and then return back. So this is another 240 meters for this number and then continue to travel additional 200 meters. So we have at 200 meters here and the value is 400 meters. C. On figure 1.2, plot a velocity time graph of the man's journey. Show any calculations that you make. Three marks. Alright, so in order to plot the velocity time graph here, we need to calculate the gradient of the displacement time graph here. So we start from 0 to 150 seconds, which is this line. So the gradient is the velocity, hence gradient is the rise over the run. So the rise is 240 meters and the run is 150 seconds. So it's 240 divided by 150 seconds, which gives us 1.6 meters per second. So it is a straight line, hence it means this man travels at a constant velocity. So it will be a horizontal line at 1.6 meters per second. Next, look at this horizontal line on displacement times graph, which is from 150 meters to 150 seconds to 200 seconds. It is velocity is zero. Hence, from the graph here, from 150 seconds to 200 seconds, it is zero. Next, we look at this long straight line, which is from 200, 200 seconds to 500 seconds. Now, the velocity again is a gradient, it's rise over the run. The rise here is negative 200 meters from here minus 240 meters divided by the run, which is 500 seconds minus 200 seconds. We get negative 1.5 meters per second to one decimal place. Hence, from 200 seconds to 500 seconds, it is again a horizontal line because it is a linear line in displace, displacement time graph, which tells us it is a constant velocity, hence it's velo horizontal line at negative 1.5 meters per second. So for this question, you need to remember that in displacement time graph, the gradient of the graph is the velocity. Question 2. Einstein suggested that a man in an enclosed lift 
cannot tell whether he is stationary on the Earth or accelerating upwards in a region where there is no gravitational field. Given figure 2.1 on Earth's surface. Figure 2.1 shows a man in a stationary lift on the Earth's surface where the gravitational field strength is G. Figure 2.2 shows the same man in a lift which is accelerating upwards with an acceleration G in a region where there is no gravitational field. A. On figure 2.1 and figure 2.2, draw and label the forces that act on the man. Two marks. We start from figure 2.1 first. Now the first force that you can draw is pointing downwards and this force is the man's weight. Alright, so the force starts from the center of the man and then pointing vertically downwards. And the second force that you can draw is the force pointing upwards through the legs of the man. Hence, as you can see from here, you can draw two arrows pointing outwards. This arrow represents the reaction force from the floor. For figure 2.2, we only have the force pointing upwards, which is the reaction force from the floor. So there is no man sweat, man's weight because the lift is accelerating upwards and there is no gravitational field. B. State what causes the forces acting on the man in figure 2.1 and figure 2.2. Two marks. So in figure 2.1, the man has a weight due to gravity. As the weight is acting on the floor through his legs, the floor reacts with the reaction force. So this is as mentioned in Newton's third law. In figure 2.2, the man has no weight as there is no gravity. The floor acts on the man with the reaction force as the man accelerates upwards with the lift. C. Use Newton's laws of motion to explain why the upward force on the man in figure 2.1 is equal to the upward force on the man in figure 2.2. Two marks. Now, to answer this question, in figure 2.1, the weight of the man can be calculated as W equals to mg. According to Newton's third law, for every action, there is an equal but opposite reaction. Hence, the upward force is same as mg but in opposite direction. In figure 2.2, based on Newton's second law, the upward force can be calculated as F equals ma. Since the acceleration is A equals g, this force is also mg. Therefore, the upward force in figure 2.1 is equal to the upward force in figure 2.2, which is mg. Question 3. A square sheet of wood has a weight of 500 newtons. The top surface of the sheet is a square with sides of 2.0 meters and the sheet has a uniform thickness of 0.015 meters. A. Calculate the density of the wood. The gravitational field strength G equals 10 newtons per kg. 3 marks. So before we want to do the calculations, we can sketch the diagram out so that we can see the picture clearer. So this is a square sheet of the wood with the side of 2.0 meters. And the thickness given is 0.015 meters. So from this information, we can calculate the volume of the wood, which is 2 times 2 times 0 0.015, and we will get 0 0.06 meters cube. So next, from the formula of the weight equals mg, the mass can be calculated as weight divided by the g. So given that the weight is 500 newtons and the g is 10, then the mass will be 50 kg. So, 
Once we have the volume and the mass, we can calculate the density, which is rho equals to mass m and the volume v. Then substitute the values 50 divided by 0 0.06. Hence the rho or the density is 833 kg per meters cube, rounded up to three significant figures. B. Figure 3.1 shows the sheet in equilibrium supported by a force F at point B. 1. Define the moment of a force about a point. 2 marks. So this is a very textbook based question. You just need to write down the definition of moment. So which is the, mo the moment of a force is the turning effect of a force about a fixed point called pivot. Moment can be determined by the product of the force applied and the perpendicular distance between the force and the pivot. Remember that the formula of moment is m equals force f multiplied by the perpendicular distance d measured from the pivot to the force applied. Two, calculate the value of f. Two marks. So to calculate the value of f, we need to based on the principle of moment, which is the sum of anti-clockwise moment equals to the sum of clockwise moment. So first we need to identify where is the pivot point. So this is the pivot point here. Then this final newtons will give us a clockwise direction of the moment. So next the force here will give us the anti-clockwise moment. Hence, anti-clockwise moment here is f times 2.0, the perpendicular distance measured from the pivot to the force here, so which is 2 meters for this case. And for the end, for the clockwise moment is 5 newtons multiplied by, this is the perpendicular distance, 0 0.84 meters, hence multiplied with 0 0.84. And the force will be 500 times 0 0.84 divided by 2.0, which is 210 Newtons. Part 3. The force is applied in a different direction, vertically upwards at B, as shown in figure 3.2. Explain why a force of larger value than calculated in B part 2 is needed to keep the sheet in equilibrium. One mark. So the answer for this question is, if the force is applied vertically upwards at B, the perpendicular distance between the force and B is shorter than in B part 2. So as you can see from this diagram here, this is the perpendicular distance between the pivot and the force if applied vertically upwards. And the previously in B part 2, this is the public distance where the force is pointing at this direction. Okay, so this distance is shorter than this distance. Then we know that mo moment is calculated with the formula m equals f times the public distance t. In order to keep the sheet in equilibrium, the force needed to be larger than b part 2 so that anticlockwise moment is the same as in b part 2. Why? Because as we know the distance is shorter, then we need to increase the force so that the moment will remain the same. Question 4. A. Figure 4.1 shows an uncalibrated liquid in glass thermometer. 1. Describe how the thermometer can be calibrated to read temperatures in degrees Celsius. 3 marks. Okay, so before I want to show you the answer here, so just give you a rough concept how we do the calibration on liquid in glass thermometer. So to do this, we need to have two reference points. So one is at 0 degrees Celsius and another one is 100 degrees Celsius. So usually we would use the melting or freezing point of water as our 0 degrees Celsius reference 
and also the boiling point of water as 100 degrees Celsius. Then after that, between these two reference points, we divide 100 equal intervals so that each interval represents 1 degree Celsius. Okay, so that's the idea how to do the calibration. Now let's answer the question here. So what we can do is, the step number one, we immerse the thermometer bulb, which is this part, into the melting ice. Alright, because the melting ice is at 0 degree Celsius. So the position where the liquid stops expanding is the mark is marked as 0, de 0 degree Celsius. Next, step number two, we place the thermometer bulb in the steam above boiling water, as this is at 100 degrees Celsius. The position where the liquid stops expanding is marked as 100 degrees Celsius. Step three, the gap between these markings is divided into 100 equal parts of marking. Each marking represents 1 degree Celsius of temperature change. Now, the temperature is ready to be used to measure temperature at degree Celsius. Part 2. The volume of the liquid changes with temperature. State one physical property other than volume that is used to measure temperature. One mark. So there are several answers for this question. I will just state the answer that we learned or inside our syllabus. So which is the induced electromotive force EMF used in thermocouple thermometer. B. Figure 4.2 shows a thin glass tube sealed at one point containing gas at atmospheric pressure. The thin column of liquid can move freely backwards and forwards along the tube. 1. Explain using ideas about molecules why the liquid moves along the tube. 2 marks. So let's analyze a bit on this question. So the question tells us that the gas pressure is at atmospheric pressure, which means it has constant pressure. The question also tells us that the thin column of liquid can move freely backwards and forwards, which means the volume of the gas changes. Hence, this is the constant pressure case where the temperature is proportional to volume. So using this idea, we can answer this question. When temperature increases, average kinetic energy of the gas molecules in the tube increases. The gas molecules move at higher speed. The gas molecules collide on the glass wall and the liquid surface at higher frequency and with greater force. Hence, the gas pressure in the tube increases. The gas pressure pushes the liquid to the right. Two, eventually the gas reaches a higher constant temperature. The liquid stops moving. Explain using the ideas about molecules why the final pressure in the gas is atmospheric pressure. One mark. So this is the answer. When the liquid moves to the right, the volume of the gas in the tube decreases. As the volume of the gas increases, the number of gas molecules per unit volume decreases. The frequency of gas molecules colliding the glass wall and the surface of the liquid decreases. The pressure of gas decreases until it is equal to the atmospheric pressure. Since the pressure between both sides of the liquid are equal, the liquid stops moving. Question 5. A. Light takes 500 seconds to travel from the sun to the earth at a distance of 1.5 times 10 to the power 8 kilometers. The wavelength of some blue light emitted from the sun is 450 nanometers. Using only this data, calculate the frequency of this blue light. Show your working. 3 marks. So to calculate the frequency of the blue light, the first thing we need to do is we need to determine the speed of the light. So we can't just 
use the standard value, which is 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. We have to calculate it out using the given data here. So the distance given is 1.5 times 10 to the power 8 kilometers, and we have to change to the SI unit, which is meters. Hence, we need to multiply another 10 to the power 3, and then divide by the time, which is 500 seconds, and we will get the standard speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. Next, we apply this formula, V equals to F lambda, where the frequency is the speed divided by the wavelength lambda. So just substitute the value, the speed is 3 times 0, 3.0 times 10 to the power 8, then divided by the lambda, which given which is 450 times 10 to the power negative 9 meters. We calculate the value, we get 6.67 times 10 to the power 14 hertz rounded to three significant figures. B. Light can travel from the sun to the earth, but sound is not able to travel through a vacuum. 1. State two other differences between light and sound. 2 marks. So this is also a very textbook based question. Just need to write the two differences between light and sound. So the first difference is light is a transverse wave while sound is a longitudinal wave. And the second difference is, the speed of light traveling in vacuum is 3.0 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second, while the speed of sound traveling in air is about 340 meters per second. Hence, light travels faster than sound. Part 2. When a string, is, when a string in a musical instrument is plucked, a sound is produced. Describe how the movement of the string causes the sound to travel through the air. Two marks. So for this question, you just need to explain how sound wave is produced. So this is the answer. The string vibrates when it is plucked. The vibration causes the air molecules around it to vibrate at the same frequency. The vibration of the air molecules creates a series of compressions and refractions in the air. Sound wave is formed, and hence, sound can travel through the air. Question 6 A. A student has several pieces of metal and a bar magnet. Describe how he can use the bar magnet to decide whether each piece of metal is another magnet, a piece of aluminium, or a piece of iron. 2 marks. So this question is testing us how can we test whether a piece of metal is a magnet, a, non, a magnetic material, or a non-magnetic material? So for this case, aluminium is a non-magnetic material, and iron is a piece of magnetic material. Okay, so now to test on the aluminium, here is the answer. When the bar magnet is placed near a piece of aluminium, the aluminium will not attract towards to the bar magnet as it is not a magnetic material. For iron, it is a magnetic material, so this is how we test. On the other hand, iron is a magnetic material, it will be attracted to the bar magnet when it is placed near to the bar magnet. Alright, so the next material is a magnet, so how can we test if it is a magnet? So here is how. If it is an, another magnet, one end of the magnet will attract to the bar magnet as unlike poles attract each other. Another end of the magnet will repel the bar magnet as like poles repel. Okay, so this is important. Only repulsion can tell us whether if it is a magnet. B. Figure 6.1 shows a vertical wire passing through a piece of card. There is a large current downwards in the wire as shown in figure 6.1. Figure 6.2 shows the card view from above. 1. On figure 6.2, draw the pattern and direction of the magnetic field lines due to the current in the wire. 2 marks. So, to draw the magnetic field line, we have to use the right hand grip rule, where for this case, 
imagine that you are holding the wire and your thumb is pointing downwards where the thumb is pointing at the direction of the current so you can see that the other four fingers it is in the clockwise direction therefore on figure 6.2 so this is how you draw the magnetic field lines so there are some rule of thumbs to follow where magnetic field lines that are closer to the wire you have strong have stronger magnetic field hence the distance between these field lines are closer to each other on the other hand the magnetic field lines that are further from the wire have weaker magnetic field and hence the distance between these few lines are longer to each other therefore do bear in mind with these rules when you want to draw the magnetic field lines on the figure 6.2 2. State the effect of an increase in current on the pattern of the magnetic field lines one mark all right so here's the answer when the current is increased more magnetic field lines will be formed the distance between the magnetic field lines are closer to each other because the magnetic field is stronger c describe how a compass is used to plot the magnetic field lines on the card three marks so for this case or for this question you need to briefly explain the experiment how we use the compass to draw the magnetic field lines so here's the answer the compass is placed near the wire the direction of compass pointing at is marked on the paper then the compass is placed at the position where its tip is pointing the direction it is pointing at is marked again so the process repeats until a circle is formed this the steps are repeated at location at different distances from the wire hence the magnetic field lines are plotted question 7 a explain what is meant by a kilowatt hour kwh one mark so this is also a textbook based question you just need to write down the definition of kilowatt hour so kilowatt hour is a measuring unit of energy it indicates that the amount of energy consumed when one kilowatt of power is supplied for one hour so one kilowatt hour is 1000 watts times one hour which is 1000 joules per second times 3600 seconds which is 3 million and 600 thousand joules or 3.6 megajoules b electricity is applied to a large building at 230 volts the current supplied is 500 ampere for a time of 3.0 hours 1. Calculate the number of kilowatt hour supplied to the building in this time. 2 marks. So, to calculate the kilowatt hour, we start with the formula P equals Vi. Given the voltage is 230 volts and the current is 500 ampere, we will get 115 kilowatts. Then, energy is the power multiplied with the time, which is, for this case, is 115 kilowatt times 3 hours which gives us 345 kilowatt hour 2. when natural gas is used to generate the electricity the cost to the electricity supplier is 16 cents per kilowatt hour the cost is only 10 cents per kilowatt hour when solar cells are used calculate the saving in cost of supplying the electricity using solar cells rather than natural gas one mark so the calculation is first we calculate the cost using natural gas which is 345 uh, kilowatt hour times if the cost which is 16 cents or 0 0.16 dollars we'll get 
$55.20. Then we calculate the cost using solar cells, which is the unit 345 kilowatt hour times with the cost, which is 10 cents, and we get $34.50. Then we compare the cost between these two methods, which is $55.20 minus $34.50, and we get $20.70. So this is the saving using solar cells. Or another method we can do is we calculate the savings per kilowatt hour first. So for this case, is 16 cents minus with the 10 cents, which we save 6 cents per kilowatt hour. And we have 345 kilowatt hour, so the total saving will be 6 cents times 345, which gives us $20.70. C. Electrical energy is transmitted at a high voltage. The voltage is stepped down by a transformer to 230 volts near to the building. 1. Explain why electrical energy is transmitted at a higher voltage. 2 marks. So the answer is, when electric current is transmitted at high voltage, the current flow through the cable is small. This can reduce the power loss due to the resistance in the long cable, which is several kilometers. Power loss can be calculated as P equals to I squared R. The smaller the current flowing through the cable, the lower the power loss. 2. Draw a label diagram of a simple step-down transformer. 2 marks. Okay, so to draw the step-down transformer, first we draw the soft iron core. And this is a step-down transformer. Therefore, First, we draw the coils on the primary. Okay, well, this is the primary coil. And this is the input AC input voltage. Then we go to the secondary, where this is the secondary coil. And this is the load, which is an AC output voltage. So, since this is a step down transformer, the number of primary coil should be more than the number of secondary coil. So do have, have this in mind when you want to draw your step-down transformer. Question 8. Given figure 8.1. A Fresnel lens is the type of lens used to view the screen in a virtual reality headset, as shown in figure 8.1. The lens consists of a series of plastic rings each section having a straight edge at a different angle. So as shown in this figure, figure 8.2 shows the cross-section of a Fresnel lens with rays passing through different sections of the lens. Figure 8.3 shows an enlarged view of a ray of light entering and leaving one section of the lens. The angle of incidence I and the angle of refraction R at the surface where the ray leaves the plastic R shown in figure 8.3. For this part of lens in figure 8.3, angle I equals 40 degrees. A. Define the focal length of a lens. One mark. So I just need to write down the definition of focal length for this question, which is focal length is the distance between the center of the lens and its focal point where parallel rays of light converge or from which they appear to diverge after refraction or reflection. Given Table 8.1 B. Table 8.1 shows the angles I and R using blue light and using red light for four different sections of the lens. The table also shows the angles through which the rays are, are deviated. 1. Calculate the angle of deviation for red light when I equals 20.0 degrees. Show your working. 3 marks. So to do the calculation, we use the formula N equals sine I over sine R. 
but you have to be careful using this formula the i and the r in this formula is the opposite of the i and the r in the table because if you want to use this formula we are assuming that the light is entering the lens or the medium okay but for this case the light is traveling uh, from the medium towards the air okay so that's why i should be r and the r should be i okay so we will use this number here the i which is the r for the formula 40 degrees the i which is the r here 72.8 will be the i in the formula 72.8 degrees then press calculator to calculate the n which is 1.4861 Okay, so we will use the same formula again where the n is 1.4861 and the r or for this case which is the i here which is 20.0 degrees. Okay, and we're going to find the angle r here. So rearrange the formula sine r equals 1.4861 sine 20 which gives us 0.50829. The inverse of sine to get the value r will have 30.5 degrees okay but don't just stop here because we want to find the angle of deviation so the angle deviation is so if there is no medium here the ray will continue to move in a straight line but because it is leaving the medium to the air so the density the optical density changes that's why it will uh, bend the light will bend so i want to find how much it bends which is this angle let's label it as theta so this angle is equal to i because it is vertically opposite angles now to find the angle of deviation will be angle r here minus the i which is 20 degrees so the r is 30.5 degrees then minus 20 degrees which gives us 10.5 degrees part 2 question 1 calculate the critical angle for red light and the critical angle for blue light two marks to calculate the critical angle we will need, we will need to use two formula the first is n equals sine i over sine r and the second formula is n equals to 1 over sine c and we can combine these two formula together since both gives us the refractive index hence sine i over sine r equals to 1 over sine c so for the red light we have calculated the refractive index n from the previous question which is 1.4861 so using this value we will use this formula 1.4861 equals to 1 over sine c where c is the critical angle so sine c will be 1 over 1 1.4861 so the critical angle c will be 42.3 degrees for the red light then for the blue light we'll use we'll take the i 40 degrees and the r 60 75.6 degrees and again don't forget that the formula i is the r value in the table and the r in the formula is the i value from the table so now uh, we are using this formula right sine i the i will be 75.6 and divided by sine 40 degrees so equals to 1 over sine c then we solve this equation sine c equals sine 40 degrees over sine 75.6 degrees so c will be 41.6 degrees for the blue light State the largest value of I for light of both colors to emerge on the right of the lens. One mark. So the answer for this question is the critical angle of the blue light, which is 41.6 degrees. Part 3. Figure 8.2 shows parallel rays of light converging after passing through the lens. Question 1. Explain why parallel rays converge after passing through this lens. 2 marks. So to answer this question, we need to explain 
why race will bend when the medium change so here is the answer when parallel rays reach the surface of the lens before leaving the lens they are traveling from an optically denser medium to less denser medium the rays bend away from the normal when they are leaving the lens the lens is designed such a way that all the rays bend towards a focal point hence the parallel lens the parallel lines converge after passing through the lens question 2 explain one reason why parallel rays of white light do not co converge to a point one mark so the answer is white light consists of seven colored lights which will bend at different angles therefore these seven colored lights will converge at different focal points hence parallel white lights do not converge at a point question 9 in a demonstration of the transfer of energy a heavy ball is suspended from the ceiling by a long wire a student pulls the ball back until it touches her nose as shown in figure 9.1 she then releases the ball from rest and she remains in the same position a state the principle of conservation of energy one mark so there are a few points to talk about uh, on the principle of conservation of energy where the first point is the principle of conservation of energy states that energy cannot be created or destroyed another point is it can it can be converted from one form of energy to another form of energy and the next point the total energy in a closed system is constant b the ball is released at point a passes through its lowest position at point b and reaches its highest position opposite the student at point C as shown in figure 9.1 figure 9.2 shows the variation of the ball's gravitational potential energy with distance as it, it travels from A to C the ball has a mass of 20 kilograms the gravitational field strength G equals 10 newtons per kg part 1 determine the vertical distance that the ball falls from a to b two marks so for this question we need to calculate the change in the gravitational potential energy gpe which is mgh so the start the starting gpe is 480 joules and at point b the GP is 160 joules hence the difference is 480 minus 160 which is equals to 20 kg times 10 newton per kg and times to the height therefore the height will be 320 divided by 200 which is 1.6 meters part 2 at one point in the motion the speed of the ball is 4.0 meters per second question 1 determine the kinetic energy of the ball at this point two marks so to calculate the kinetic energy we need to use kinetic energy formula which is ke equals to half mv square and then we substitute the values given so the mass is 20 kg and the speed is 4 meters per second therefore it will be half times 20 times 4 square which is 160 joules question 2 determine the potential energy of the ball at this point one mark to answer this question we need to apply the principle of conservation of energy where the loss in gpe will be equal to gain in ke so remember remember energy cannot be created or destroyed it has it can be only be converted from one point uh, one form of energy to another form of energy first from G, G, gpe becomes ke so the loss in gpe is initial gpe minus gpe at this point which is equals to the gain in ke and it is 160 so initial gpe is 480 
joules which we can get from the previous uh, from the graph then minus gp at this point equals to 160 hence the gp at this point will be 480 minus 160 which is 320 joules part 3 on figure 9.2 sketch the variation of the ball's kinetic energy with distance two marks so the answer will be this All right so to plot this graph remember that principle of conservation of energy applies so the loss in gp equals the gain in ke assuming that there is no energy loss the total energy in the closed system always constant so at point a the gp will be 480 joules and the k is zero, zero joules total joules will be 480 joules at point b gp now is 160 joules and ke is 320 joules the total joules will be 480 joules as well and at point c GP is 480 joules and K is 0. So the total joules still the same, which is 480 joules. C. As the ball returns from C towards A, it just touches the student's nose. The experiment is repeated with a light plastic ball of the same dimensions as the first ball. Explain why the light plastic ball stops further from the student's nose when it returns towards A. Use ideas about energy in your answer. Two marks. Okay, so before I show you the answer, let's uh, take a look of this question, right? So we, if we change the ball from heavy ball to a lighter ball, so what happened is, we the air resistance or energy loss will be more significant compared to the heavy ball all right so that's how or the idea that you need to think about when you want to answer this question so here's the answer when the ball has a larger mass energy loss due to air resistance is negligible as the change in kinetic energy in the system is much greater than the energy loss due to air resistance when it swings from a to c and back to a however if the ball has a smaller mass the change in kinetic energy in the system is much smaller compared to the ball with larger mass hence energy loss due to air resistance is more significant and the light plastic ball stops further from the student's nose when it returns towards a question 10 either given figure 10.1 Figure 10.1 shows part of the apparatus used to measure specific latent heat of fusion of ice. A glass funnel is filled with melting ice. The apparatus is left in a labor laboratory for some time before the heater is switched on. A. Explain why the ice continues to melt before the heater is switched on. Use the ideas about conduction, convection, and radiation in your answer. 5 marks. Alright, so to answer this question, you need to think about how the heat or the thermal energy can be transferred to the ice and causes it to melt. So, which is by conduction, convection and radiation. So for conduction, heat can be transferred to the ice through the objects that are in contact with the ice. Examples are the glass funnel and the heater rod. For convection, Convection happens at the bottom of the ice where the air in that region absorbs heat from the ice. When the air around the ice is heated, it has higher density than warmer air. Hence, it sinks while warmer air will rise and absorbs heat from the ice. The process repeats, creating convection current. For radiation, warmer air from the surrounding emits infrared radiation. The emitted infrared transfer energy to the ice and cause it to melt. B. 
After a few minutes, the ice melts at a steady rate. The mass of water collected in the cylinder is 0.036 kg in a time of 6.0 minutes. The measuring cylinder is then emptied and replaced. When the heater is switched on, 0.059 kg of water is collected in 6.0 minutes. Part 1. Calculate the mass of ice melted in 6.0 minutes due to the electrical energy supplied to the heater. One mark. So to calculate the mass of ice melted due to electrical energy, we will take 0.059 kg minus with 0.036 kg and we get 0.023 kg. Part 2. The current supplied to the heater is 1.8 ampere and the potential difference across the heater is 12 volts. Calculate the energy supplied electrically to the heater in 6.0 minutes. 2 marks. So to calculate the energy, we need to use this formula E equals to power multiplied by the time. So given all the power is Vi, then T, given voltage is 12 and the current is 1.8 ampere, multiply with 6 minutes and we have to convert it into seconds, hence we multiply with 60 seconds, we'll get the energy is 7,776 joules. Part 3. Calculate the specific latent heat of fusion of the ice. 2 marks. So the formula for specific latent heat of fusion is Lf equals E over M, the energy divided by the mass. So energy 7776 joules divided by the mass which is 0.023 kg and we get 3.38 times 10 to the power 5 joules per kg rounded off to three significant figures. Question 10. Given figure 10.2. Figure 10.2 shows the IV characteristic graph for a red light emitting diode LED and for a green LED. A. Part 1. The resistance of the green LED is very large when the potential difference PD is negative. 2.0 volt. Describe how the resistance changes as the PD increases to positive 2.0 volt. 2 marks. So to calculate the resistance from a uh, IV characteristic graph, it is R equals to 1 over gradient of the IV, IV curve. So from this equation, we can see that the resistance is inversely proportional to the gradient. Hence, from negative 2 volt to 1.0 volt, the gradient is 0, which means that the resistance is very high at this range. Now we continue from negative uh, from 1.5 volt to 2 volts, the gradient is increasing. So, which means that the resistance decreases at this range. And from 2 volts onwards, the gradient is constant at and can be calculated as 50 minus 10 divided by 3 minus 2, which gives us 40 milliampere per volt. And the resistance becomes constant, and it is calculated as 1 over 40 milli, which gives us 25 ohms. Part 2. Describe two differences between IV characteristic graph of a piece of metal wire at constant temperature and the graph of the green LED in figure 10.2. Two marks. So the answer is, the piece of metal wire always follow Ohm's law, which is V equals to IR, where the current is proportional to the voltage. Hence, starting from zero, the IV graph increases linearly. On the other hand, the IV graph of the green LED only becomes a linear graph after it passes through its cutoff voltage 0.7 volt as the LED is forward bias. When the PD is less than 0.7 volt, the IV graph of the metal wire still changes linearly 
as it continues to obey Ohm's law. On the other hand, IV curve of the green LED is almost zero as it is reverse bias and at very high resistance. B. Figure 10.3 shows a red LED, a green LED, a 9.0 volt battery, and a resistor R connected in a circuit. The PD across each LED is 2.0 volt. Part 1. Using figure 10.2, determine the current in resistor R. One mark. So from the graph, when the potential difference V is 2.0 volt, we can see that the rate LED current I rate is 50 milliamps, and the green LED current I green is 10 milliamps. Hence, the current for the resistor IR is the sum of the red LED current and the green LED current, which is 50 plus 10, and we get 60 milliamps. Part 2. Calculate the resistance of resistor R. 3 marks. So to calculate the resistance, we will need to find the PD across the resistor R first, which is VR, and it can be calculated as the input voltage minus the PD across the LED. So which is input voltage is 9.0 volt and the potential difference on LED is 2.0 volts. Hence, the PD across the resistor is 7.0 volts. Then we can calculate the resistance of the resistor R, which is V over I, and substitute the value, which is 7.0 divided by 60 milli, and we get 117 ohms. C. When the PD across the red LED and the PD across the green LED are both 2.0 volts, the red LED is brighter. When the current in the red LED and the current in the green LED are both 50 milliamps, the green LED is brighter. Using figure 10.2 suggests why. 2 marks. So the brightness of the LED is determined by the power dissipated by the LED. Power can be calculated by the formula P equals Vi. From the graph, when both LED have the same PD, which is 2.0 volt, we see that the current in green LED is 10 milliamps and the current in red LED is 50 milliamps. Hence, power dissipated in green LED will be 2 times 10 which is 20 milliwatt, while power dissipated in red LED is 2 times 50, which is 100 milliwatts. Hence, red LED is brighter as it dissipates more power. On the other hand, from the graph, when both LED have the same current, which is 50 milliamps, we can see that the PD across the green LED is 3.0 volts and the PD across the red LED is 2.0 volts. Hence, power dissipated in green LED is 3 times 50, which is 150 milliwatt, and the power dissipated in red LED is 2 times 10, which is 100 milliwatt. Therefore, Green LED is brighter as it dissipates more power. Alright, that's the end of the paper and that's all for this video. Thanks for watching. Do you have any question or doubts to ask? Feel free to write it down in the comment. I would love to hear from you. Do you like this video? Please don't forget to like it and share it with your friends. Support me. If my videos benefit you in your learning, you can treat me a cup of coffee. To do this, link is at the description area. Until then, see you in the next video. Have a great day ahead and all the best.